Last week we were reading this beautiful passage which starts on page 14 in which Shobindo describes all the qualities of Savitri's nature which make her a perfect shrine where the God of love can live. Her, her mood, her, her atmosphere, her way of being is able to house his divine love. And we read that in her he found a vastness like his own, his high, warm, subtle ether he refound and moved in her as in his natural home. In her he met his own eternity. So I'm going to read on from there. Till then, till the moment when love in the wilderness met Savitri, till then no mournful line had barred this ray. On the frail breast of this precarious earth, since her orbed sight in its breath-fastened house opening in sympathy with happier stars where life is not exposed to sorrowful change. Remembered beauty, death claimed lids ignore and wondered at this world of fragile forms carried on canvas strips of shimmering time. The impunity of unborn mites was hers. Although she leaned to bear the human load, her walk kept still the measures of the gods. Earth's breath had failed to stain that brilliant glass, unsmeared with the dust of our mortal atmosphere, it still reflected heaven's spiritual joy. Almost they saw who lived within her light, her playmate in the sempiternal spheres descended from its unattainable realms in her attracting advent's luminous wake. The white fire dragon bird of endless bliss drifting with burning wings above her days. Heaven's tranquil shield guarded the missioned child. A glowing orbit was her early term. Years like gold raiment of the gods that pass. Her youth sat throned in calm felicity. But joy cannot endure until the end. There is a darkness in terrestrial things that will not suffer long too glad a note. On her too closed the inescapable hand. The armed immortal 
bore the snare of time. One dealt with her who meets the burdened great, a signer of the ordeal and the path, who chooses in this hollow cost of the soul, death, fall and sorrow as the spirit's goads. The dubious Godhead with his torch of pain lit up the chasm of the unfinished world and called her to fill with her vast self the abyss. August and pitiless in his calm outlook, heightening the eternal's dreadful strategy, he measured the difficulty with the might and dug more deep the gulf that all must cross. Assailing her divinest elements, he made her heart kin to the striving human heart and forced her strength to its appointed road. For this she had accepted mortal breath, to wrestle with the shadow she had come and must confront the riddle of man's birth and life's brief struggle in dumb matter's night. Whether to bear with ignorance and death or hew the ways of immortality to win or lose the godlike game for man was her soul's issue, thrown with destiny's dice. But not to submit and suffer was she born. To lead, to deliver was her glorious path. Which side are we starting today? You can begin, sir. If the mortal life and death is faith, on the, on the faith test of this Petrius death, since the uh, sight needs the first cause, opening in Sympathy with happier stars. Their life is not exposed to sorrowful change. Remember to be dead. Time keeps ignored. And wonder, wonder at this world of her fragile. fragile forms. Carry on canvas sheet of shimmery time. The infinity of the world. Unborn. Unborn. Night was there. Thank you. So, till then, that refers back to this um, line 127 on page uh, 14. Love came to her hiding the shadow death. So till that happened, till then, this ray of light, which is savagery, had not been barred, hadn't been crossed by any kind of mournful line, by any kind of sadness or unhappiness. 
And then Shobindo explains why and how this could be. He says that ever since she first opened her eyes as a baby on the frail breast of this precarious earth, he says this earth that we live on is full of danger and we can't rely on anything here. Its breast seems to us solid, but it may give way at any moment. It's frail, it's breakable. Since her orbed sight, he means the orbs are the eyes. Since her eyes opened in its breath fastened house. Shobindo often refers to our body as the house. It's the house for the spirit, for the soul. It's also, he says, the, the, the house for the sight. Uh, we look out of this house of the body and see the world around us. He says when her eyes first opened, they, when they opened, they were in sympathy with, they were seeing things in the same way as beings from happier stars, other solar systems, where life is not exposed to sorrowful change. Here on our earth, life is always in danger of change and sorrow and unhappiness. But there are worlds where it's not like that. Savitri has come from those worlds of higher happiness and when as a small child she first opens her eyes she's remembering what it was like there where she's come from, from those happier stars. And her sight is remembering beauty from those worlds, a beauty that our eyes don't know anything about. He says, our death-claimed lids. These are our eyelids, and our eyelids, like the whole of our physical body, is, belongs to a world in which nothing lasts. We have been born, and we will have to die. This body is sure to die. No? So these eyes, they don't know anything about the beauty that Savitri is remembering from those other worlds. So as a baby, and perhaps many babies do this, when they first open their eyes, they are wondering, what kind of a world is this? Where have I come to? Now, her, he says her sight, she was wondering at this world of fragile forms. If you, somebody sends you something made of glass on the box, it will be marked fragile, this way up. Something that's fragile will break easily. All these forms here are breakable. They are not immortal and deathless. And this world of fragile forms, all the forms, he says, are carried on canvas strips of shimmering time. It's an image from the theater. In the theater, uh, they make the scenery, they paint the scenery on canvas strips. Hmm? So he says all the scenery and the forms of this world, it's like that. But the strips are like the canvas strips in the theater, but these are, this is scenery of time. The things don't last long, the time is uh, shimmering, it has a kind of light and movement, um, and the, the things that we see uh, don't last long. 
So since the time when Savitri, as a small baby, first opened her eyes and looked at this world and felt the wonder comparing it with the world that she's come from. Since that time, the impunity of unborn mites was hers. Impunity. Impunity means that you can't be attacked or damaged in any way. Um, usually uh, in a country like India or Germany or wherever, um, the ambassadors representing other countries, they have impunity. Uh, they can do things and they can't be punished by the law of the country. Mm. Of course, the, uh, if they do really bad things, then the, the government of the country will say, send them away, we don't want these people. But they can't be prosecuted. I think it, uh, also high government officials and uh, prime ministers and presidents, they have some kind of impunity. It means they can't be punished. Mm. So, in a way, Savitri is like that. She's immune because she's an immortal being. She's carrying with her her immunity, her impunity of unborn mites, the strengths which are not born and die, which are immortal, eternal, infinite. She's carrying that kind of strength within her. So that is why, until this moment when love meets her in the forest, no mournful line, no line of happiness, unhappiness, no line of sorrow had barred this ray of light which she represents. So that was a difficult sentence you had to read, Suresh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bebel. All she means to hear the human world, her work can still the measures of the gods. Girls press had failed to stay in the dream class. Unsmeared is the dust of our mortal atmosphere. It still reflected heavens. Yes. So she had leaned down, she stooped down to come and be born here on earth and to help humanity to bear this load of responsibility of the life in the evolution. But although she's done that and come to live with us here on earth, her walk kept still the measures of the gods. She still walks like an immortal being, full of confidence, uh, no fear, nothing. And then he speaks of Savitri, or perhaps of Savitri's spirit, as a glass, a mirror. And he says that the breath of earth the earth atmosphere had not made any stain or dirty mark on that brilliant, shining mirror of Savitri's consciousness. It is still unsmeared. If there's a lot of dust and uh, you try to clean it, then it'll leave a, a smear, a dirty mark on the glass, on the mirror, or on, we, we find it all the time with the windscreen of the car as we pass through these dusty uh, Oroville lanes. No? We get the, it gets, the glass gets smeared. So her consciousness has not been smeared or dirtied in any way by the dust of our mortal atmosphere, the atmosphere of we, earth beings who are 
subject to death. Her consciousness is still reflecting that spiritual joy which is natural to heavenly beings. Do you like to read? Almost they saw who lived within her light, a playmate in the sanitary spheres, descended from its unattainable realms. In her attracting Edwin's luminous wake, the white fire dragon bird of endless bliss, drifting with burning wings to both her days. Mm. So those people who lived close to her, the ones who lived in her light, they could almost see this subtle playmate who has come with her, her playmate from those sempiternal spheres, those eternal, infinite, immortal worlds. That white fire dragon bird has come down with her. When she came down to earth, he was uh, attracted to follow her. Her advent, that's her coming to earth. You know? And uh, in the wake of her coming, if uh, we go in a boat, a motorboat on water, the boat as it moves along, it'll leave a wake, a white trail behind and you can get fish and uh, the birds can get drawn along in the wake. So this white fly, uh, fire dragon bird, when Savitri came down to earth, he was attracted and he followed down with her. This white fire dragon bird of endless bliss. And the people who lived around her could almost see him drifting, gliding with his beautiful burning wings above Savitri's days. He's protecting her. One of the many beautiful pictures that Shobindo shows us. The young Savitri and her subtle playmate. Sarojini. Heavens of Jampoli, silt, blood, the missing child, a glowing orbit was her early turn. Tears like gold remained, remained of the gods that pass. For your search, stoned in calm felicity. But joy cannot enter until the end. There is a darkness in terrestrial things that will not suffer long to lost a heart. On her to close the ins, ins, inescapable. inescapable hand. The armed immortal both the snow of time. Yes. So that dragon bird is part of the protection of heaven, that calm shield, this protection which is guarding Savitri, the child, this one who has been missioned, who's been sent with a mission, with a responsibility. So her early term, the time of her youth, was like uh, a glowing orbit, like a comet circling the sun, perhaps. And the years were like, were golden, like the, 
the, the raiment, the clothes that the gods wear. So it's as if each year or each of the seasons is a, a wonderful god clothed in golden light. Her youth sat throned in calm felicity. She is, of course, a princess, but it doesn't mean exactly that. It means that in her happiness, in her confidence, in the impunity of those inborn mites, it's as if she's uh, a royal being on a, who sits on a throne and that gives her a calm happiness. But on our earth, joy cannot endure, it cannot last until the end. It's not possible for anyone to pass through a human life without facing some suffering. And he says this is because there's a darkness in things that have to do with the earth, terrestrial. This is the terrestrial globe. Terra is one of the names of the earth. And that darkness won't allow people to be too happy for too long, for very long. That darkness will not suffer here it means allow, it will not allow too glad a note, too much happiness for long. Sooner or later, something will come along. And this is now what's happened to Savitri. On her too, that inescapable hand of sorrow and suffering has come down and caught hold of her. Savitri is like a, is an immortal being, as if covered in armor, she's protected. But since she has come to earth, she too has to bear being caught in this snare of time. A snare is a trap that we use to catch a bird or a small animal. She can't escape that if she comes to live on earth. So now she's been caught in the inescapable hand and uh, Shobindo describes uh, the being who has caught hold of Savitri now Ganga Lakshmi. One who dealt with her who needs to earn the A senior. A signer. A signer. A signer of the ordeal and the past. The truth in the holocaust of the soul. That fell. Fall. 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 Death, fall, oh, and death, fall, and sorrow as a spirit. The dubious goddess with this torch of pain lit up the chassis of the unfinished world and called her to feel with her vast self. Yes. So somebody, some being is dealing with Savitri now. And this is a being who meets all great souls who carry great responsibilities, the burdened great. His job is to assign to them, to give them their particular ordeal, test, and their particular path. So that assigner chooses 
in this world, which is a holocaust, a soft, uh, a, 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 an offering, a sacrifice. <clears throat> the soul makes a sacrifice in this world. Mm -hmm. And that being chooses death, fall, sorrow. Fall meaning a, some loss of the completeness of the soul's divinity. So what he's doing with Savitri, this dubious Godhead, he's holding up a torch, a light, the pain and suffering that she's feeling now is lighting up for her the unfinished world. This world has not reached what it's supposed to be yet. It's unfinished. There's a great big yawning gap, a chasm, a huge hole. And he's calling on her. He's telling her, you, you're a great being. Can you fill up this big gap? Can you, with your vast self, can you fill this terrible hole that needs to be filled up for the earth to fulfill its divine destiny? Kamala. Sorry. Oh, a goad is the stick that you use to poke a, a bullock or an elephant to goad it. You, you make it feel some pain so that it will go faster. Hmm? August and pitiless in his heart. Heightening the eternal dreadful strategy, he measured the difficulty with the mind, and dug more deep the gulf that all must cross. Assailing, assailing her divinity, divinest, the divine, huh? her divinest, her divine most divinest. Yeah. He made her heart kin to the striving human heart, and forced her strength. It's a point Yes, yes. So he has no pity. He's above all this. He's august, majestic, pitiless in his calm outlook. This being has to do the best for the world, for the divine purpose, the best also for Savitri. So, since she's such a great being, he has to give her a greater test. He has to heighten, to make more intense and powerful the dreadful strategy of the eternal who uses pain to help us progress. Hmm? So he is measuring the difficulty that he's facing her with with her might, with her power, because she's such a great and powerful being, he's giving her a more difficult test than an ordinary human being would have to face. So he makes that chasm deeper. He dug more deep that gulf that all of us have to cross. He attacks to test her most divine elements, the most divine parts of Savitri. One of those is her heart. Her heart that's able to love the whole universe, no? What is it? The whole world could take refuge in her single heart. So that powerful 
divine heart that Savitri has. He has to make it in a way equal to the struggling human heart. It's like uh, in golf, they give people handicaps. The very good golfers um, have to perform much better than the ordinary ones. So if you are very, very powerfully endowed in some way, they may make you carry a handicap. So that's what he is doing. He made her heart kin to, very similar to, the striving human heart which struggles and finds such difficulty. And he forces her strength to its appointed road. He's the one who assigns the path, no? And he has to force her to follow exactly that road that she has to follow in order to fulfill her mission. This is the dude, this is the one, the one who dealt with her. Amalkiran has asked Sri Aurobindo about this one. Who, who is this one? So uh, Sri Aurobindo said, I've deliberately not given him any name, but you can call him the Lord of Evolution, if you like. Hmm? He's the one who has to challenge the, the strong to help them to progress, and if they progress, they will carry the whole human race with them. But the Lord of Evolution is Yes, well, he may take this role sometimes of forcing us to follow our appointed road, even if we don't want to. But I guess all humans will have a path. Everybody has a path. Yes, yes. And uh, so one of the reasons why our path is not always smooth and easy, it's because challenges help us to grow and to fulfill uh, what we are supposed to become. Mila. So for this, to face this unfinished world, this is why she has accepted to be born as a human being, to breathe the breath of one who is subject to death. She's come here as a human being in order to wrestle with the shadow with the darkness, this darkness that will not suffer long, too glad a note, this darkness that all human beings have to face. She wants to overcome that shadow completely. So she has to confront, she has to face the riddle, the puzzle, the very, very difficult puzzle of a human birth. And the way life here has to struggle for a short time before it's overcome by death. Here in this night, this darkness of dumb matter. Matter which can't express its divinity. It's because of matter that we, are, we have to die, that these bodies can't live forever. So her mission, what she's come to do, she has to decide whether she's going to accept, 
to bear with this present state where humanity is ruled by the grip of ignorance and death, or whether she's going to hew the ways of immortality. To hew means to cut your way through with great strength. If you're an explorer passing through an impenetrable forest, you may have to cut a lot of things down, hew things down to create a path where others can follow you. But we also hew rock. You might have to hew a tunnel through a mountain. Hmm? Savitri has been born to hew, to cut the ways through which other human beings can follow her to the immortal state. She's come here to, uh, on earth to try and win the godlike game for man. It's a kind of gamble. Will she be able to succeed? It's a divine gamble. So this is the issue for her soul. The issue, that's the name of this canto. Here he sums up the issue in these few lines. This is the, the, the issue for Savitri's soul. Is she going to be able to win this godlike game for man? And this is a game of dice, like the ancient Indian Princes used to throw dice to settle very important things. Uh, the dice, these are destiny's dice. If she wins this game, it will change the destiny of the human race. Uh, Fell more again. <clears throat> but not to submit and suffer as she won't, to, de to deliver us her glory and God. I was so happy after a strain and fit for the days in the presence of us. Yes. So Savitri has not been born as most of us are born. To submit, we have to accept. We have to accept the suffering that we go through. Hmm? She was not born for this. She has been born to take the lead and to set people free, to deliver. This is a glorious part, a glorious role that she has been born to, pay, to play. And so she is different in her nature from ordinary human beings. Uh, he speaks about the fabric, the stuff, the, the material that she's made of. She's not made of anything earthly. Here was no fabric of terrestrial make. She's not uh, formed by earth nature. That fabric that uh, earth makes is okay, it's fit for a day's use by busy, careless powers. You can wear it one day perhaps, but it's not very durable. It soon wears out. And then he describes uh, what this terrestrial fabric is like. Joel. An image fluttering on the stream of fate half animated for a passing show, or cast away on the ocean of desire, flung to the eddies in a rootless sport, and tossed along the gulfs of circumstance, a creature born to bend beneath the yoke, a chattel and a plaything of time's laws, all one more arm who comes destined to be pushed. One slow move forward on a measureless board in the chest plate 
of leaders, so with whom such is the human figure drawn by time. Yes, that's the fabric of terrestrial make. The human life, the human being, is something only half right real, an image fluttering on a screen, on the screen of fate. He, he has to follow whatever fate decides. He's only half alive, half animated for a passing show, maybe like a puppet. I think he uses this image of the puppet. Just for a passing show, for a short time. Or a castaway, somebody who has fallen off a ship or been pushed off a ship hmm, into the ocean of desire. The human being, many human beings are like that. You know? The soul has just been dropped into this ocean of desire and get carried along by the eddies, the whirlpools of that ocean. And somebody's enjoying that. They've pushed him there on purpose in a ruthless sport, a pitiless game, you know, so that he gets tossed along the gulfs, the, the, the rough seas of circumstances. Human beings don't have that much control over the circumstances of their lives. Perhaps there are powers who make fun of us by dropping us into the ocean of desire. Why desire is big? Is there a I can't tell you. <laughs> I think, yes, it must mean the ocean of desire. It's the whole principle of, of desire. Yeah? A human being is often a creature who's just born to submit and to suffer, born to bear the yoke, the, like, a, like a bullock having to draw the plow, who is, just, who is just a belonging, a chattel, not really a person, a chattel and a plaything of the lords of time, immortal beings who organize how things happen in time. Or maybe we are just one more pawn. You know the game of chess? In the game of chess, there's a board with black and white squares. And um, the, the smallest, least powerful piece is the pawn. And Many of us are just pawns who we come into this world destined to be pushed just one move forward, just move forward one square on this measureless board. The real chess board, I think, has eight lines, no? But this is a measureless board in this chess play of the earth soul with doom. Such is the human figure drawn by time. But Savitri is not like this. She is a conscious frame, conscious body even, a self-born force. She's not pushed about by any of these beings. She is fully in charge of herself. So we'll stop there for today. Those who want to read can stay.
Till then, no mournful line had barred this ray. On the frail breast of this precarious earth, since her orbed sight in its breath fastened house, opening in sympathy with happier stars, where life is not exposed to sorrowful change. Remembered beauty, death claimed lids ignore, and wondered at this world of fragile forms, carried on canvas strips of shimmering time. The impunity of unborn mites was hers. Although she leaned to bear the human load, her walk kept still the measures of the gods. Earth's breath had failed to stain that brilliant glass, unsmeared with the dust of our mortal atmosphere, it still reflected heaven's spiritual joy. Almost they saw who lived within her light, her playmate in the sempiternal spheres, descended from its unattainable realms in her attracting advents, luminous wake, the white fire, dragon bird of endless bliss, drifting with burning wings above her days. Heaven's tranquil shield guarded the missioned child. A glowing orbit was her early term, years like gold raiment of the gods that passed. Her youth sat throned in calm felicity. But joy cannot endure until the end. There is a darkness in terrestrial things that will not suffer long too glad a note. On her too closed the inescapable hand, the armed immortal bore the snare of time. One dealt with her who meets the burdened great. Assigner of the ordeal and the path, who chooses in this holocaust of the soul, death, fall and sorrow, as the spirits go, the dubious Godhead with his torch of pain lit up the chasm of the unfinished world and called her to fill with her vast self the abyss. August and pitiless in his calm outlook, heightening the Eternal's dreadful strategy, 
He measured the difficulty with the might and dug more deep the gulf that all must cross. Assailing her divinest elements, he made her heart kin to the striving human heart and forced her strength to its appointed road. For this she had accepted mortal breath, to wrestle with the shadow she had come, and must confront the riddle of man's birth and life's brief struggle in dumb matter's night. Whether to bear with ignorance and death or hew the ways of immortality, to win or lose the godlike game for man was her soul's issue, thrown with destiny's dice. But not to submit and suffer was she born to lead to deliver was her glorious part here was no fabric of terrestrial make fit for a day's use by busy careless powers an image fluttering on the screen of fate, half animated for a passing show, or a castaway on the ocean of desire, flung to the eddies in a ruthless sport, and tossed along the gulfs of circumstance. A creature born to bend beneath the yoke. A chattel and a plaything of time's lords. Or one more pawn who comes destined to be pushed. One slow move forward on a measureless board in the chess play of the earth soul with doom. Such is the human figure drawn by time. A conscious frame was here, a self-born for. 